Thanks, Likeables. Oh, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and it's Monday morning. And of course, community matters at 12 noon. So the question before the House is, is the, uh, the Philly shipyard announcement likely to become true? <laughs> and um, we, we heard an announcement from the Philly shipyard uh, recently, and uh, there's, there's more to these announcements than meet the eye. If you want to ask a question or um, uh, make a comment in the conversation, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 415-871-2474. So our guest for the show is our old friend Mike Hansen of the Hawaii Shippers Council. So um, on Thursday, I think, uh, Philly Shipyard announced that it would construct four new container uh, vessels to service the U.S. mainland Hawaii route which is currently only serviced by Pasha Hawaii and Matson, both based in Honolulu. Mike will discuss what this means, what it's likely to happen, and how it fits in the Hawaii marine landscape. Welcome to the show, Mike. Nice to have you here. I'm glad to be here and see you again, Jay. So let's start with the beginning. Uh, I, we can't go all the way back. For now, though, just for the framework of this discussion, there was an announcement on Thursday. What was the announcement and by whom? Yeah, Philly Shipyard, one of the seven uh, major shipbuilding yards in the United States, announced that they would be building, uh, or at least um, beginning to uh, organize themselves to build four brand new container ships for the Hawaii trade on speculation. And coming in here, building four ships on spec, coming in here, getting whatever necessary permits there are, and being one of now three uh, carriers well, uh, in these Philly islands. Philly Shipyards didn't indicate that they would be operating the service. Uh, what Philly Shipyards did say is that they were in the process of discussing this with uh, a Jones Act operator uh, uh, who would uh, enter the trade. And what is the Jones Act operator? A Jones Act operator is one that uh, is 75 percent citizen owned, which is a requirement of the Jones Act, and has uh, U.S. built Jones Act eligible ships mm. that they operate. And these ships uh, that Philly Shipyard contemplates would be Jones Act ships? Yeah, Philadelphia, Philly Shipyards is located in Philadelphia, in the old Philadelphia Naval Yard. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are a, uh, a domestic shipbuilder, though they are fully owned, 100 percent owned, a wholly owned subsidiary of a Norwegian company whose stock is traded on the, on the Oslo mm, Stock Exchange. That's very interesting yeah. that somehow that qualifies, even though it's owned it's by It's because it's in the interest. United States. Okay. See how really silly that is, the, you know, the Jones Act requirement of being in the United States, when in fact it's owned by interests outside well, the United in, States. in addition to that, uh, the design of the ships is being done by a Korean shipyard, <laughs> Daewoo, uh, and uh, the main engines are going to be coming from Daewoo in, in South Korea. And most of the equipment will be coming from specialist manufacturers in, in Europe. <laughs> Okay. And most of the steel plate will come from China. <laughs> It'll just be assembled in Philly shipyard. In fact, the Coast Guard uses the word assembled yeah. in, in their uh, determinations of whether or not a vessel was built in the United States. Well, this is, sounds pretty silly. So when they say that they're going to use a, 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 um, a Jones Act operator, they don't necessarily mean Matson or uh, Pasha. No, they, uh, ex they, uh, they excluded both Matson. So it would be someone else. Right. And um, we have a, there's really only four Jones Act operators who operate what's known as a liner service. That's a common carrier uh, ocean shipping service. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's enormous amounts of, uh, of software that go into this. I mean, everything from build, taking the cargo, receiving it, uh, in uh, having the proper containers and documentation services. It's, it's, a, it's a big setup. It's a big setup. And this is not something that's done by someone who's running a little tug and barge. What, what kind of uh, permits do you have to get to set up, um, you know, a, a, a four new ships running the U.S. Uh, mainland there's Hawaii actually, trade? There's actually no regulatory requirement in terms of getting approval to enter the trade. 
uh, you would have to file with the Surface Transportation Board your tariffs. And the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest hurdle they have to overcome, a third new entrant to the uh, ocean container shipping market would be a terminal in Honolulu Harbor, none of which exists at the present time. So it's not just building the ships and bringing them out here for the trade and filing a tariff. I guess it's, is the tariff approved or just filed? It just filed. So you just file it for public disclosure of what your charge is going to be, that's right. all. And that's a federal filing, yeah? Yeah, that's, the, that's with the Surface Transportation Board. That's a federal agency. Okay, but so it's, it's more than all of that, though. You have to actually have a terminal. Why do you have to have a terminal? Uh, because you've got to put the cargo ashore. Okay. If you've got all the nice little shiny ships and you can't get the cargo ashore, you haven't accomplished the task. Yeah. So, well, can't you rent a terminal somewhere? Uh, we don't have the terminal space. We don't have container terminal space in Honolulu Harbor to accommodate a new, a new entrant carrier. Who's responsible for making sure that we have enough terminal space to accommodate any ships that come uh, here? The State Harbors Division which is a division of the De State Department of Transportation. Well, I mean, is it is implied in this is that perhaps they should be building more terminals? They are building a new terminal at Kapalama Basin called the Kapalama Container Terminal. That's not done yet. It will not, they just started work and that will not be completed for approximately five years. Five years to build a terminal, wow, that seems very slow. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. So, um, okay, so th was there a time factor in the announcement made by Philly Shipyard? They say they're going to do this now or later? Yes, or they were going to be able to deliver these four new ships uh, uh, all prior to uh, uh, 2011. Uh, prior to? I mean, 20, uh, 20, 20 21. 21. Well, that's five years from now, or almost five years. Right. So, presumably, I suppose, the terminal that they're building at Kapalama would be ready by then. Well, the terminal at Kapalama is, uh, has been fairly well um, designated for Pasha. And Pasha, as the successor company to Horizon Lines, as the successor company to CSX Lines, as a successor company to Sealand. That's how long that terminal has been in planning process. Oh my God. So, you know, what, what strikes me, and I was going to mention this to you, you know, the Department of Transportation Harbors Division is one of the most powerful agencies in the state. It's long been the case because we're a waterbound state. We rely on this, and power comes from having an exclusive position. Yeah, but the, the Department of Transportation also has the airports, yeah, and it has the highways. Yeah. So yes, it's enormously powerful, and you can see the problems that the airlines are having at the airport with the recent proposal to create a, a, a port commission for just the Hawaii State Airports. Yeah, uh, that's that's another show or shows. I mean, uh, yeah. we would like it, to talk a, about it's that. It's a huge mess. So uh, what I'm getting at, though, is that if the Department of Transportation, which is ultimately a political animal, uh, didn't want uh, Philly Shipyards or its operator to come here, they could stop them, couldn't they? Uh, yes, and really there's, uh, if the cop once the Kapalama Container Terminal is completed, then Pasha has to install the container cranes and the other equipment to operate the terminal. Yeah. And then shift their uh, operations there. Uh, basically from Pier 51 Alpha, which is over on Sand Island, that space is going to go to Matson, according to the harbor plan, which would leave Pier 1 open for a new entrant carrier. For the Philly ships? Yes. But, is that big enough? Uh, it's probably big enough. It's pretty. It's marginal, but it would probably be big enough for their operation as, as it's being contemplated. Mm -hmm. The problem there is that uh, the the container cranes there's none there. They have to be installed. That's a big job. Yeah. The, and the uh, the gantry tracks uh, are no longer uh, 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 suitable for container cranes. So all of that has to be rebuilt. At, at a significant expense. Oh, sure. Many millions, I expect. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, we're talking, this is something that's quite far off in the future, if it will ever be done. 
Well, has the Department of Transportation said anything? You know, welcome Philly. Uh, uh, we're looking forward. Uh, we're going to make room for you. From the uh, media people that I've spoken to, who have spoken to Harbors Division, uh, Harbors Division said that there is n uh, no agreement in place for f for the Philly shipyard proposed operation. Well, that sounds pretty unrealistic to uh, build four ships on spec. That's, that's what hundreds of millions anyway. Maybe yeah, we're more. talking. We're talking somewhere. Uh, a little north of two hundred million dollars a piece, and uh, those are those will be American hulls. They'll be more expensive than ships built outside of the United States. Right. You could build the same ship in South Korea, for example, for fifty million dollars. Yeah. The reason that we're facing this situation is that Pasha uh, is having, from what I understand, from what I've heard from various parties, is having a difficult time uh, arranging the financing to to build the four ships that they want in the Texas yard of Keppel. I see. So they got another and, initiative out there with the competitor and, and, and what shipyard. the shipyard is doing is they're trying to get the jump on that. Yeah. Knowing that uh, that uh, Pasha uh, can't uh, complete the deal and then Philly Shipyard is offering to build these four ships threatening to come into the trade but at the same token, uh, Philly Shipyard is also saying that we will arrange financing through what's known as a bare boat company. You know, it's a financial arrangement where the uh, owners of the ship is, uh, will uh, pay for it and then lease it to, her, uh, to Pasha. As a bare boat charter. As a bare boat charter. Yeah. Or demise charter. So it's less for lawyers like me. It all sounds pretty specky, though. I mean, I, you know, frequently I think the newspapers that take press releases, uh, this was in, oh, the uh, Star Advertiser, and it was in PBN, I thought, uh, last right. week. Uh, uh, it was on page of press releases, and you really wonder if there's any, any, uh, any uh, real the, action uh, going on. In both the Honolulu Star Advertiser article, uh, they spent, uh, oh, maybe a third of the article discussing what I had to say and quoting me. So they did state the other side of the coin. Mm, good. And uh, the uh, Pacific Business News ran their first article basis, just what was in the press release. It sounded like we're going to have a new shipping line immediately. And the uh, second, next day, Friday, I think it was Friday, they ran my side of the story. So. We did, that side did get out. From what I understand, Philly Shipyard is planning to come to Hawaii and hold some kind of a press uh, uh, event. Wow, so they, they are going to follow they, through, that's at what least they on the media. Said. Yeah. They've hired a local uh, PR representative, Shane Peters, who is... Uh, who was, uh, he's of the Peters family, Holy Drake and, and Henry Peters. Mm -hmm. And um, he was the communications director for Neil Abercrombie in his 2014 mm -hmm. uh, race for re-election. So there'll be more on that, but uh, you know, what we haven't really discussed is your response, uh, and I think we need to do that, but we we'll take a break first. Sure. We come back, Mike, we're gonna take a break. It's Mike Hansen, the Hawaii Shippers Council. <laughs> And we're talking about this announcement by Philly Shipyard that we're going to bring four new ships out here from the mainland. We'll be right back. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. So Mike, you're really an expert in this kind of thing about shipping uh, between here and the mainland and the whole um, arrangement with Matson and Pasha and all that. 
And I wonder if you could tell us what your response was, the response you made when the newspaper called you uh, about this announcement by Philly Shipyard. Yes, uh, basically it uh, was an interesting development, but not unprecedented. Uh, the previous owners of Philly Shipyard, uh, a company called Con uh, Kevin Co Coverner, uh, also Norwegian, uh, back in 2004 and 2005, uh, had built a series of ships for Matson, and they were having Matson. They were having some difficulty with Matson accepting the last two ships in the series. And as a result of these, this breakdown in their negotiations with Matson, uh, the then owners of Philly Shipyard uh, formed a company called uh, Ocean Blue Express, and they hired the recently retired then uh, president of Matson, C. Bradley Mulholland, who many people will, here will still remember, uh, to be the head of that company, based in uh, in San Rafael, California. And they threatened. They were originally here, but they moved to San Rafael, right? Who's they? Matson. Oh no, uh, Matson did go to San. R they were in Oakland for a long time. They went to San Francisco actually, mm -hmm. and then Oakland and San R Rafael. They, okay. Um, a lot of the shipping businesses moved to San Rafael just because it's a, a cheaper place to operate, and you know it's uh, easier to get around. The but Ocean Blue Express. Uh, then threatened to come in and operate uh, in competition with Matson, and at the time, Pier One was open, and so that's where they were proposing to operate. Where's Pier One now? Uh, Pier One is at the, near the entrance to Honolulu Harbor. Um, do you know where the foreign trade zone is yeah. located? Okay, the foreign trade zone is at Pier Two. That's a great location, isn't it? Uh, it's a big. That was that was a Matson's. Uh, uh, during the uh, the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, that was the Matson Terminal. Yeah. And so that whole area was developed for Matson's so containers. Just before they moved to Sand Island. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's a, it's, a, it's a good terminal, um, but there's no container cranes there any longer. And the tracks for the container cranes um, are no longer uh, uh, workable, mm -hmm. so that on the apron would all have to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. This is the one you were talking about right. before. It's a big expense. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Ocean Blue Express uh, threatened in late 2004 come into competition with Matson, and by Feb by the end of February 2005, Matson had signed contracts with the then operators of Philly Shipyard uh, to purchase the two ships. And those two ships are now operating in Matson's fleet. Mm -hmm. And this is very reminiscent of that uh, power move on the part of so Philly Shipyard. If I can get this straight, so Shipyard comes in and says, um, we want to sell you some ships, and um, we're, we're just going to build them on spec, we're going to deliver them out to you, maybe one of your competitors, and, uh, and then, you know, if you want to buy them, you can buy them, and then you wind up buying them because you don't want your competitor to come in and use the very same ships. Exactly. And this happened in 2005 with uh, Ocean Blue Express, and it looks like, at least to you, it looks like it's happening again now exactly. in this Philly shipyard announcement. Yeah, there, there isn't the terminal space in Honolulu Harbor, and uh, you're looking at a limited market. Mm -hmm. I mean, Madsen said to have maybe 70% of the container market and Pasha maybe 30%, mm -hmm. something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So, what do we got here? What is the landscape? Uh, I mean, are they in high competition, Matson and, and Pasha? Pasha's um, big problem is that they've got, well, they've, they've got six ships. Two ships that are of, re of recent build that they built themselves. One is a pure car carrier, meaning it just takes v uh, uh, automobiles and small trucks. We have that much automobile and small truck traffic that's, that several ships involved? Yes. That's interesting. And it's one way. I no, mean, no, we, it's two way. Oh, we, we take them off the island also? Uh, this is the way that the rental car agencies work. 
Ah, they bring them in and take them back. They move the cars around depending upon market conditions. Ah, okay. So there's a two-way traffic. Interesting about how important cars are to Hawaii, both in, in the ordinary uh, consumer driving and also in, uh, in uh, the tourism yeah. business. But anyway, okay, anyway, so. So, so uh, Posh has got a uh, pure car uh, carrier. They also have one what's known as a Conroe. It's the lower part of the ship is is a garage. They call it a garage ship, some people. And the uh, weather deck and above is for containers. So container and row, row, mm -hmm. con row. Mm -hmm. uh, con row is two years old. The uh, pure car and truck carriers uh, built in 2005, I think it is. So she's uh, about 12 years so old con now. Con row is a more advanced technology for shipping? Uh, yeah, it's a, it fits in certain circumstances. For example, uh, Matson's building uh, has uh, placed an order for two Conroes with uh, General Dynamics Nazco shipyard in San Diego uh, for their California Hawaii trade because they are carrying many vehicles as well. So, you know, the old saw is that we pay an enormous amount of money. Um, we pay more for consumer goods here that are shipped in than anywhere on the mainland, really, because we have to bear the cost of all the shipment. Um, is it as efficient as it should be between Matson and um, Pasha to give us decent prices? Uh, or is this a, a kind of held hostage arrangement where those two carriers are just raising the prices on us and making every last quart of milk more expensive? Uh, yeah, the, the Jones Act and the requirement to use U.S. built ships or U.S. built vessels uh, does add significantly to the cost. Um, if you look at uh, the, um, the, the federal statistics, uh, Hawaii is somewhere around 17.5% higher cost than the mainland. You mean for shipping? No, for Cost the of goods, living. Goods, okay, cost, cost of, of everything that comes in. Yeah. And uh, if we look at that, uh, you know, perhaps two, three percent of that is uh, attributable to the Jones Act. Okay. And there's different parts of the Jones Act. You know, you've got the requirement for uh, a vessel to be built in the United States to carry cargo between two domestic points. The ship has to be um, registered to the f to the United States, meaning U.S. flag. You have to have a U.S. crew and U.S. ownership. The most expensive part of the uh, of the requirements is the build requirement. Sure. Typically, now it's costing to build a self-propelled seagoing ship uh, in the United States is costing five times what it costs in South Korea, for example. And this is why there is such, uh, this is why uh, Pasha, for example, is having such a difficult time renewing the four old container ships that they uh, acquired in the purchase of Horizon Lines Hawaii service. Those ships are approaching 40 years of age. That's old. Very old. Should be retired by then. Scrapped, yes. Uh, the uh, the, old, the uh, average age of a container ship in international trade is 12 years. And there's been recent uh, reports of uh, container ships being scrapped at seven and eight years of age. So this is way beyond what any, anyone else in the world is ever dreaming of. And there aren't that many ships manufactured in the United States, uh, are there? I mean, we, we, we are not, we, it's not really a good market, I, I guess, for we, American We, we build ships. about two and a half uh, self-propelled seagoing ships per year. Merchant, in the country. Merchant ships, yeah. That's peanuts. Of course. The uh, oceans are filled with ships that are built somewhere else. Yeah, there's approximately 40, this is a, these are ships over 1,000 gross tons. Yeah. Um, worldwide, there's uh, something on the order of 40,000 such ships. So, I mean, I find and, it, I find and it. Be, and between the uh, <coughs> Japan, South Korea, and China, which build 95% of these kinds of ships in the world, uh, they produce almost a, uh, very close to a thousand ships a year. Why is it so expensive to build a ship in the United States? Because we are so inefficient. We don't have uh, the volume to
to uh, bring the cost down. We, we've essentially lost the market. We've 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 let it go. The market the market is somewhere else. Um, foreign countries, foreign businesses that don't have to com, com, comport with the Jones Act would never buy an American ship. Am I right? Yes, we're not competitive. Yeah, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has not been competitive in uh, shipbuilding since the Civil War. That's really too bad. Prior to the Civil War, uh, when uh, ships were wood and propulsion was by sail, uh, the United States, beginning in colonial times, was the most efficient, low-cost builder of ocean-going ships. And this is, what, this is what led to the, the dominance of the, of the clipper ships. Hmm. Well, so what does it mean, efficient? I mean, is it design? Is it uh, engineering? Or, all the or, or all is the it labor? What is it? <coughs> <laughs> yard organization. All these ships, all the merchant ships that are being built in the United States today are being built under license to foreign shipyards. So we're importing the design. We import the design, the, most of the steel. We import the main engines and most of the equipment. It's just really a way to get around the Jones Act. It's, it's yeah, the, the, trying to modify the effect of the Jones Act. But all that considered, you know, when we sort of take everything you and I have been talking about, um, how does this, how does this move whether Philly Shipyard um, either comes here, as it has announced, which seems doubtful, or, or sells ships to someone else, a bare, bare boat charter, what I, have you? I'm, I'm uh, fairly certain that Philly Shipyard's target is Pasha. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. If you read their press release, the Philly ship press release, it's all about Pasha. They want to sell ships to Pasha. Pasha's got a gun at their head. The four old uh, container ships they acquired from Horizon Lines will be regulated out of service on January 1st, 2020, because they're steamships and they no longer meet the emissions requirements. Ah. Okay. And it appears that Pasha has not been able to, for, to, to finalize the shipbuilding deal with Keppel in Texas. Okay. So this is a way to force Pasha to buy the Philly ships that, exactly. that are being built, quote, on spec. Now, what, you know, there's various possibilities that could unfold over the next few years about this, but it sounds like there will be a change, that the economics of the situation require a change from Pasha's point of view, I guess. And the question I put to you, Mike, is how is this going to affect us? What are the differential effects we might suffer? Are we going to be paying more to ship goods in? Um, are we going to have uh, fewer carriers, more carriers? Uh, my, is my, it good to have fewer or more? Uh, in my opinion, you'll have the same carriers. Uh, Not going to change. Right. This is just a, a fandango that's happening now. It's a ploy. Yeah. A ploy. Okay. A red herring. A red herring. <laughs> okay, so the question, question then is, is this red herring going to raise that 17%? Well, is this red herring going to cost us more as consumers? Well, uh, uh, Pasha, is, are gonna, these new ships will be far more efficient than the old ships that are operating today. But the capital cost of these ships is going to be much greater. So there'll have to be a much larger contribution. Sure. To so they got to return income, uh, get a return on their investment. They have to repay through a bare boat charter payment, yeah. you know, the cost of the construction of the ships. Yeah. So and Philly Shipyard makes out in any event. Well, Philly Shipyard sells it to a third company who in turn finances the, the it's business. It's a finance thing. Of course. And they in turn bare boat it to, uh, to, uh, to Pasha. Now, Pasha is going to end up paying probably a lot more for these Philly ships than they would have paid for the Keppel ships had they been able to finance the Keppel ships. Mm. But they're intimidated by this move, so they'll probably go along uh, and buy from, the ships. From, what it, from the scuttlebutt but that I hear, um, they, they, Pasha couldn't close the deal with Keppel. Mm. Hasn't been able to at this point. At least not yet, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's really uh, not clear what's going to happen. But and I wonder, you know, this this will probably uh, 
I would imagine this will probably kill the, the, the Keppel deal. Mm. And so Posh is going to be looking at... Because of the pressure from the Philly shipyards. Sure. And uh, they've got a deadline to meet. Yeah, or because for environmental person. deadline. Yeah. So, but the question, you know, is I think one thing that strikes me, and let's close on this, is that none of this is subject to the regulation of the Public Utilities Commission. They may regulate inter-island trade, but not trade between here and the mainland. Not yeah, the trade is, these this ships is, are this involved is in. interstate trade. Yeah. Yeah. And so they don't have any jurisdiction on that. That's correct. So there's the, nothing. The, the U.S. Constitution, which you well aware of, uh, has an interstate uh, commerce clause. Right. Yeah. And, and that's so what, there you have it. Absolutely. And, and so there's really nothing we can do. Am I right? To regulate what's happening, to participate in this decision process. Well, this is all between these big carriers and shipbuilders. And, until 1995, uh, the Public Utilities Commission. I shouldn't say that. The um, uh, the um, the public advocate, uh, consumer, the advocate. consumer advocate, uh, uh, had uh, intervened in the rate cases in the federal system with the Federal Maritime Commission. But then they stopped. But yes, because there was a change in the regulatory venue. It went. Uh, there was the 1995 uh, Interstate Commerce Commission uh, Termination Act, and that. Uh, uh, shifted the regulation of what was known as the non-contiguous trades. So a different venue, and thus it made it more difficult for the consumer advocate and, and, well, the and state agencies. The consumer advocate basically said, oh, uh, from what I understand, you know, it's too much work. We'll yeah, do. we're not going <laughs> to. So it happens, uh, it happens the way it happens, Mike, and maybe we should check back with you and see the way it goes over the next few months and years. Sure. Thank you very much for coming down. Really appreciate it. Mike Hansen, the Hawaii Shippers Council, keeping us current on things on the waterfront. <laughs> Thank you, Mike.